uh, you know, sit in your pants uh, on your laptop on the beach. It's a great picture. Exactly. Um, and then make millions of pounds or it's isolating. You will never see anyone. You'll be depressed. Um, and it's the worst thing ever. And obviously the reality is somewhere between the two. Divergent. Um, we are talking about human-centered business. So, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, we're going to be talking to guests week in, week out about the things that make, I guess, business a better place to be. How do we do better things for people in general, whether that's consumers, whether that's for employers, employees, in fact, as well. Um, and so you are an ideal guest for us. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. You set up Leapers, which is a support group for freelancers and self-employed, right? Yeah, that's right. It actually started out as a, a group for people who were thinking about working in different ways. It was at the time when flexible working, different kind of working hours. I think that's when we first met yeah. to have a conversation about what the mix were doing because people were struggling and, and kind of uh, looking for different ways to work, but didn't really know where to turn and have that conversation. And interestingly, the group very quickly, it wasn't about the what hours should you do and what tech do you need and the operations of it. It was about the emotional side of things and actually, oh, I don't know, I, I feel a bit disconnected when I'm working from home or I don't know who to get feedback from or I don't know how to have this conversation with my boss. Um, and, and that emotional space, that emotional territory, it's difficult to have a conversation with your manager about it if mm. you're feeling awkward or if you're self-employed, you don't have an HR team or a person to talk to. So we focus pretty quickly on on that uh, mental health space, sure. lowercase m, not kind of um, diagnosed conditions or illnesses or things like that, but all of the things which kind of influence your mental health positively and negatively to say, hey, it's okay to feel a bit rubbish at times. Yeah, sure. It's kind of fascinating because when you say it out loud, it's so obvious that, you know, if you're a freelance person <laughs> yeah. or if you're self-employed, you don't have those networks. What was the thing that made you, and I think like all great businesses, spot that in a place that, you know, perhaps others hadn't seen that challenge? I don't, I, I think it is a really common understood thing about freelancing. I think it's over-exaggerated though. I think there are two narratives, or there were always two narratives around freelancing. One was the kind of four-hour work week, mm. uh, you know, sit in your pants uh, on your laptop on the beach. It's a great picture. Exactly. Um, and then make millions of pounds or it's isolating, you'll never see anyone, you'll be depressed, um, and it's the worst thing ever. And obviously the reality is somewhere between the two. I think what we wanted to do really is help people think about that more actively. Um, a, before they jumped into freelancing. That's why it's called Leapers, because it is a bit of a leap of faith, and suddenly yeah. you realise, oh my God, there's all these additional things that I just hadn't considered before. Sure. Um, but B, that, that it's an ongoing active consideration. It isn't something that you only think about when things are feeling worse. There are things which you can do to prevent those negative influences. There are things which you can do to make sure you have the support systems before something goes wrong. So if something goes wrong, or increasingly when something goes wrong, that you have people to turn to, you have resources, you know where to turn rather than it going, oh my God, I'm in this situation, I don't know who to talk to or ask or anything. And that feels obviously doubly worse. So when you do start your own business, you're having to juggle so many other things and there are new laws and new kind of technologies and stuff and your business plan and all this kind of stuff. And, and quite often you as an individual fall off that to-do list. That's an interesting point because presumably you were also going through all of those things in terms of the juggle and, you know, as a freelance or self-employed person, you're constantly in that sort of feast or famine mindset, aren't you, of yeah. how do you find your next gig and yeah. all of that sort of stuff. Like physically, how did you then also on the side start something like Leapers, which feels like such a huge commitment um, and such a great idea, but, you know, clearly you've got your own your own thing going on. Like how or what propelled you to, to do that? Um, at the time, so I've been self-employed for my entire career I've only had one job officially um, and I was in that job at the time and I had a six month notice period and I was trying to work out what I was going to do next um, and in that time I was I was having lots of conversations with different people around um, you know different types of roles and how they were working and there was a lot of people who were moving in and out of the marketing industry at the time peers and colleagues and I was just saying you know what are you doing what, what you're kind of where are you going what's your headspace at 
And a lot of the conversations were around, actually, I don't want to do nine to five. I don't want to do Monday to Friday. I don't want to do the job as it is designed now. I want Mm. to think about maybe um, part time or I want to be thinking about this and this and this and a portfolio career. And, And there was a lot of conversation just around what I called, you know, designing how you work as opposed to just somebody telling you this is how we work. Yeah, yeah actually sitting down and go well what do I need to work around so I'm a single parent so I had like I know that I need to spend time with my children I want to spend time with my children and that's a big driver for how I work and when I work so that's one thing I know that I need to be uh, doing lots of different things because I get bored very quickly so I want to be able to have shorter term projects rather than long so sitting down and thinking about those things and I started writing about it Um, on LinkedIn mostly and people started reacting to it and LinkedIn is not a platform for conversation it's a platform for like (laughs) stating a controversial opinion and getting people uh, arguing with you Um, and I said I actually I want to have some better conversations with people yeah let's create a slack group whoever wants to keep on having these conversations about changing how we work and and why we work come over here and (laughs) let's have a have a bit of a chat And the Slack group started and a few people came over and more people came over and more people came over and and it became this space for conversation. And, you know, there was no intention there really. And from that grew into what Leapers is today once we realised there was this focus around the emotional side of stuff. So how did I start it? It was accidental. How do I maintain that? I now see it as part of my job. I, I, you know, I, I very much see my job as being connecting people supporting people I have some things which I get paid for which is also about building better teams and getting people to see the opportunities and things and thinking about things differently so I see it as part of the job even though it doesn't generate any money I love that I love the accidental nature of the way in which things start I mean it's so often the case isn't it that it's not a plan it just is something that you saw that needed to get done and you went and did that and I think that's incredible yeah I, I think you know it's it's probably a bit of a cliche in startup land right it's a, a, a consumer <laughs> problem that needs to be solved there are lots of businesses who create problems that try and then engineer a you know they have a solution which they want to create a, a, a problem for but I think anything is based upon a really solid you know truth or an insight or that there is a issue that somebody is facing and leapers was very much around you know five years ago when when we were starting there wasn't anywhere that freelancers could turn to to talk about mental health because Mm. there there wasn't any content about it there was no no one writing about it there were a few journalists maybe who were talking about burnout and um you know kind of lack of support this was before the film and tv charity did their through the looking glass report on on how poor things were in their industry there just wasn't any data on it Mm. you know there wasn't any research even we couldn't find anything other than I think there was a a co-working business that said freelancers are lonely therefore the answer is a co-working space (laughs) but there wasn't anybody talking about it and that makes people feel you know if I couldn't find it and I was actually looking for this stuff if you're feeling isolated and disconnected and you're like oh god I'm feeling like this and you can't find anything about it that makes you feel really lonely yeah I can imagine thinking about that then and I love the way that you described it almost like fixing an insight because obviously that's mostly what we do at the mix um how has that changed over the last five years because clearly what you set out to do five years ago the context and the world in which we all live has shifted to some degree I would say just a little bit um have you seen as a consequence the reason or the kind of challenges that are faced by the people in your community change with that or do you think that we're still dealing with some of those really fundamental questions around just support and help in those kind of much more primary ways that perhaps you set out to address oh it's a great question I I think oddly in many ways actually things haven't changed massively for freelancers we were probably better prepared for COVID Mm. than any other group of people because we were already working remotely primarily we already did have to deal with uncertainty yeah absolutely um so I think in in lots of ways and that's why leapers were able to get you know move so quickly off the market at the start of the lockdown loads of people came to us for support on working remotely in isolation and feelings of uncertainty because we had that material already it wasn't new to us there are lots of things which the self-employed have as a unique set of challenges that employees don't 
but 80% of it is is universally true, you know, kind of make sure that you're sleeping well and eating well and exercising and make sure you have a support network and those sorts of things. I think what has changed um, for the better, people, yeah, clients are more open to things like remote and, um, you know, kind of you can have a team that is working anywhere. You don't need to be dragging them to a, a center place and different ways of working and models of working and flexible hours. All those things have, have changed for the better. I think what has possibly changed for the worse is that a lot of employers have woken up to mental health, which is great for their employees, but they're not including their total workforce. Mm. They're not seeing freelancers as part of that package. And in parallel to that, there's a number of uh, increasing challenges from a legal perspective, from a taxation perspective that freelancers and small businesses have, something called IR35, which prevents, effectively prevents employers from taking care of their freelancers because it puts them into another tax bracket. Right, right, right. They're not allowed to do things like give them access to any kind of healthcare provision or invite them to drinks and those sorts of things. I've actively had employers saying, we can't be seen to be doing these things mm. because suddenly we have to pay NI and tax and all this kind of stuff. So I think a lot of law is making it harder for small businesses to do really well. Um, it's it's more and more complicated than it's ever been. Um, it's less cost effective. The, the myth around freelancers making loads of money and not paying taxes is, is so not true. Never has been true because they don't have paid holiday. They're having to pay double tax, income tax and corporate tax. But all of those benefits which offset that are being removed. And it's just harder. And I think uh, more than anything else, uncertainty is um, unfortunately universal constant um but that is just it, it's never felt more uncertain and more kind of volatile yeah. for for the self-employed it's a real challenge isn't it i think in that in that world of uncertainty where i guess employers are absolutely to your point perhaps stressed out enough about their own yeah. kind of group rightly so rightly so absolutely to your point and i think it's an interesting one isn't it because you would imagine and i think you raised it already that the whole dynamic shifting with remote work would perhaps even the playing field to some degree because you wouldn't necessarily have these kind of physical spaces where mm. you have groups of people in front of you and then maybe groups of people who aren't in front of you, yeah. which make it much more evident that you've got this kind of real difference between the freelance community or your self-employed community versus, say, your core cool workers. But that sounds like that's still not happening because of maybe the complexities that you've raised. Yeah, I think... I think the reality is that everybody's busy, right? And, mm. and you know, somebody who invites a freelancer to work with them in, in their day job, they are probably supported by an HR team who's thinking about stuff like onboarding and contracts and making sure the signposting to support and employee assistance programs. So there's, a, there's a whole framework and structure to bring a new employee on and also you have a longer period of time you know you can get to know that person over six months they're coming to drinks and all you know whatever it might be to to immerse themselves into the culture of the organization so a lot of those things happen some by serendipity some by design um, whereas people who are coming into businesses for a much shorter period of time don't necessarily have that. They don't have the water cool moment where you're going, oh, yeah, actually, you should chat to Jim because he can connect to you. Those sorts of things don't happen. So they have to be more actively designed and put in place. And quite often, that responsibility falls between the cracks because freelancers quite often aren't an HR thing because it's not an employee. Yeah. Quite often they're hired by, let's say, it's, you know, head of a studio or somebody who's just bringing somebody sure. in for a short period of time. And there isn't necessarily a person who is, a, you know, a chief freelance officer who's managing those sorts of relationships. So it can quite often just fall between the cracks. And also, I think we as freelancers hide the problem. We're very good at coming into an organisation we know that there's not going to be somebody going, okay, here's the tea and the coffee mm -hmm. and how to get started. Um, so we we navigate that really, really well. And we take it upon ourselves to figure out how to get started because it's in our interest. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, there's a risk that you feel, oh God, if I'm asking too many questions or I'm being difficult, they're just going to find the next person. Even if that's not true, there's the anxiety of that. So we mask that actually it would be really more efficient if there was a great onboarding, if there was a kind of place you could turn where all this information exists, that things like feedback are really important, that we don't necessarily chase those things because we don't want to be difficult. 
Um, so it's a hidden problem. It's it's not a, a, a concern for employers because they don't think there's enough of an issue to really have to fix. It's an interesting one when you put it in those terms because actually freelancers and you know people who are self-employed are brilliant then at navigating yeah. that world of work, perhaps in a way that you know people who are employed just don't have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have all of these skills which are incredible. Yes. And, you know, perhaps we're not really making the most of some of that in the context of... Uh, Definitely, yeah. I think, well. I think um, you know, not everybody is... And I say freelancers, right? I mean, that it's, it's like parents <laughs> or mother, women. You know, it's like kind of grouping everybody together in a single grouping label, is which is ridiculous. But you, I think there are definitely some people who um, thrive in those sorts of situations. There are others who are brilliant craftspeople who have decided to become self-employed but aren't great at all the other stuff. Um, you know, if you're, let's say you're an illustrator, you might be a brilliant illustrator, but that doesn't mean you're brilliant at marketing or sales or, you know, kind of onboarding yourself onto a project or doing all the kind of stuff which comes with it. You're brilliant at what you do, but you're a business owner when you become self-employed. And I think that's often the disconnect is a lot of people really go, I didn't realize how to do all these other things. I'm not good at it. Um, or the, or they are good at it and they don't have they don't feel they're confident in it or imposter syndrome kind of kicks in. I know that's not necessarily a, a thing which is, is necessarily defined, but this feeling of, of a lack of confidence, even if it's not warranted, um, and all those things kick in. So I think you, you have to be good at it. If you're not good at it, it feels like you're failing in some way. And the thing which we always say is, look, just because you work for yourself, it doesn't mean you're working by yourself. If you're not great at something, that doesn't mean you have to shoulder all of that responsibility. So many people who are self-employed don't do their accounts, right? They use an online system or an accountant. There's no shame in going, I don't know what how to spell HMRC. I'm going to give that to somebody else. It's the same with things like marketing or, or the same with things like um, negotiation. You can build up a team of other people who are great at those things and work with them to create a stronger offering. And that that's one of the core things that we talk about all the time is, is building that team mm. for yourself. So you're not having to shoulder that burden yourself. But I think you're absolutely right. The, the, those who can navigate those organizations brilliantly, I think there is... Uh, an emotional intelligence that a lot of freelancers have that is about listening you know you have to understand what your client really needs yeah. from like day one so you can get off and going and being uh flexible because you can't just be no i'm not going to do this i only mm. want you have to be responsive and reactive to what they're doing and resilient you know i i think one of the most common feelings when you're self-employed is is a dealing of rejection if you're going to get a job, if you're an employee, you're maybe moving a job what, you know, every two and a half years or something. So you get a small window of where you don't get uh, those jobs that you're applying for. If you're a freelancer, you're getting told no every day, every week. You're having to apply for 30, 40 projects. You're going to get turned down for the majority of them. Um, so that feeling of, of, of rejection is, is continual. So uh, having a sense of those who are brilliant at it have a sense of resilience and know that isn't actually rejection. It's part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. It's so, I mean, I can so empathise with that, that feeling that, you know, when you do something for yourself, you are putting yourself on the front line basically every day, aren't you? There's a real burden from a mental health point of view in terms of just showing up and yep. having the energy and the enthusiasm every single day can yep. be quite I don't know, I guess it can be quite burdensome after a while. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're a person I've known for a little while, and I'd say that you're an incredibly empathetic human being in general terms. What you've just said almost describes yourself, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, the world in which you've had to navigate, being just acutely aware of what's going on around you and therefore being able to slot into those situations so that you can get work, basically. Is that something that you think that you would just are, that's kind of who you are through and through, or... To your point, is that something that you've almost had to learn in order to do the work that you do? Um, you know, does it come really naturally to you or is it something that's, uh, you know, part of the, the world in which you have to operate? I th I, such a good question. I, I think, first of all, I think probably what you see of me is not necessarily true. You see a very small sliver of what I present the reality is that I 
really struggle with self-esteem and confidence i don't think i'm very good at navigating those sort, sorts of circumstances i feel i always feeling a massive sense of getting knocked back or kind of uh, rejection kind of really sensitive to rejection and i'm constantly teaching on the feel of like, i'm not i don't enjoy feelings i'm not good at it. i'm like Wah. um it's one of the reasons why very selfishly leapers exists is so that i've got a whole lot of people <laughs> to go i'm really struggling i need to talk to somebody please help me yeah, it's just yeah, like yeah. a really selfish project it's amazing um but but you question around you know do, are those things natural or do you have to build them up i think it's a bit of both i think you have to be continually working on those things i think you have to be aware of it you know you have to kind of be sitting at the end of the week just looking back and going how did I feel this week and, and why what is causing those things and then you have to start to ask yourself well okay what are the situations that's make putting me into that situation where I'm feeling that again and again do I want to do something about this and this is negative and positive you know if I felt great about something how can I engineer those situations again if I felt bad about something what can I do to improve that and it's the same with being an employee, right? You know, you you get thrown into a situation and you're like, oh, I haven't got the skills to do this, whether it's emotional or you know, tangible cap, you know, capabilities. An employee quite often has a manager going, oh, we're going to put you on this course or we're going to, I've spotted this, let's work on that. Whereas when you're self-employed, you have to do that for yourself and coming back to the burden, that's a lot. You mm. oh, I have to be really self-aware. I have to be investing in my own development. I have to be, do, 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 do. and it feels overwhelming, and I, you know, there's no easy answer to that. And I think that's where the feeling for a lot of people of that exhaustion or mm. just like, oh, uh, comes because I'm having to do the job and all this stuff around it. And I don't have anybody to, that's just got my back. And that's yeah, tiring. That is, yeah, it's really tiring. Just listening to you, kind of, I can just feel that sense of yeah. exhaustion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so true. Thinking it's about. To, it's, it's counterpoint though. Yeah. When you do a great piece of work and you get that positive feedback from somebody or see the impact that it's had, it's amazing. Yeah. When you do high. win that project or when somebody says, oh, that's, that's really good stuff, that's amazing because that's you and no one else. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all about balance. You know, it, it's, it's about the two things and understanding how there are negatives and there are positives. And the net net, if you have more negatives than positives, then you need to do something about it because that can really make you unwell it can lead to mental illness as opposed to just poor mental health and if you're not aware of those things that's the slippery slope which we try and encourage people to prevent it strikes me hearing you talk about this that you know if you think about that world of linkedin because i think we're all we're all very much on that platform aren't we for, yeah. for good and for ill and it strikes me that what you say of the experiences that you and your community have had probably are the feelings that lots of people have now yes. even if they're employed because yes. I think everyone is so much more acutely aware of their own sort of personal brand and you know operating in their careers in a way that to some degree probably feels a, bit, a little bit like you are self-employed mm -hmm. rather than working for a larger organization so it mm -hmm. doesn't feel as though the things that you're talking about and the challenges that that anyone you know in the leapers community face aren't things that you wouldn't maybe also feel you know if you're an employee somewhere and you're Absolutely, struggling yeah. to get your next move in your career or whatever it feels like there's loads and loads of places where those are, are kind of big overlaps there absolutely uh, you know probably 80 percent of looking after people and taking care of of your people is universally true mm. you know people need to have a sense of belonging psychological safety they need good communication they need good strong relationships and support networks um you know all of these things are just fundamental human needs and i believe that if you design working with people in you know holistically and just think about how would we run a good business that cares for its people and does great work regardless of what the employment contract is or regardless of how long the person is around then you're going to solve all of those issues because you start with running a great business not yeah. oh how do we fix this issue and that issue it's like how do we work well um there are a bunch of unique things that the self-employed do face that employees don't and i think those need to be 
you know, employers need to be more aware of those things. They don't need to take the whole responsibility because it's not their responsibility. The individual needs to. But I think if they can solve really simple things like a good onboarding, like getting paid on time, you know, that is still a massive... Ma- you run a small Seriously. business. You know how frequently you're having to chase Ugh. invoices. And the emotional load of that, I mean, it seems like, oh, God, you know, it's just, no, 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 no. but actually for an individual, right? First of all, the amount of people in our community who say, I feel bad for chasing. I feel awkward that I'm, oh, God, sorry, do you mind if I get paid? I mean, how ridiculous is that? Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. It's an absolute fair feeling, and they're feeling that. So you can't <clears> say, like, you shouldn't feel like that. That's really. But, you know, organisations are making people feel like that. And that turns into them being distracted. It turns into them having less time. Mm. It turns into them not being able to do as good a job for you as their client as possible. So by helping those people work well, you're only going to get better. Even if you don't care about their well-being, right, you care about the quality of their work. So by supporting your people, they're going to do better work for you. That's the, that's the bottom line. That's the ROI. Pay people on time. Pay people on time. Oh, it's such a burden. Um, are there surprises that you've had, I guess, in terms of the ways in which people have helped in a positive way as well? Because it's, it's clear that obviously there are some major challenges out there, but presumably in the last few years, you have also seen people try harder, think about this stuff more. You know, again, probably COVID, I guess, has probably had an impact on that. So have you got examples or places that you've gone Actually, do you know what? My heart is gladdened by <laughs> some of the things that are happening in the world today. Yeah, definitely. I, mean, I think, you know, more than ever, this sense of or the, the ability to create communities relatively easily, but create digital spaces or create places where peers can connect and support each other. I think that has exploded in the last two, three years, enabled partially by technology and enabled people being not together as often. And we're seeing more and more organizations, whether they be the clients, um, creating communities of where their freelancers can hang out, where the people can hang out, which is great because that fosters peer support. We're seeing a lot of the the, the technology platforms or the, the the workforce platforms like you know Juno or WorkSum, you know, actually create communities for their people as well. So there is more of a sense of belonging and you do have others to talk to. And I think surprisingly and and really positively the really large organizations are getting far more systemic in looking at their total workforce rather than their employees and non-employees um so um uh, they're, they're creating more kind of alumni networks where actually they go back to all the people they've worked with in the past and said hey you're still part of our, our family and our friends this is what's going on and and I think that is a recognition of this increasing shift, more so in the US than in the UK perhaps, but an increasing shift to more fluid workforces and a recognition that if you want to be able to hire the best possible talent, you need to treat them well. And the great resignation, for, for better, for worse, I think is making organisations go, actually, we want a longer relationship with our people rather than just when they're with us want to build a, a lifetime relationship with those people so they can come back to us mm. or or we can maintain a conversation over time it's slow um but i think there are inroads to seeing actually there are there are benefits in treating uh workforces as being more fluid yeah and that requires relationship building rather than onboarding and offboarding you must have been at the heart of so many conversations recently about just the relationship we have with work, just as a consequence of the kind of style of work yeah. that you do and the chats that you have with your own community. Do you think that it is possible to get to a place of balance and harmony? I mean, your own experience. Balance between what? Uh, I guess work life, because, you know, that great resignation, as you as you rightly mentioned, has really been a consequence of people just looking around and going, do you know what, work is just a bit shit, if we're quite honest, and it takes up way too much of my life, and I want to do something else. Balance suggests that there are two things that are separate. Yeah. And I don't think they are. I think work is such a significant part of life that to treat them as completely separately, uh, separate entities, is inaccurate and you'll never really get there um i think it's more about integration and and um and thinking about respect for certain things that you're doing at certain times so there's the whole kind of conversation around 
you know, should email out of hours be illegal, for instance, to help people set boundaries? Personally, I think, well, that suggests that there is a set of hours, but that's another conversation. <laughs> yeah. um, th- I think what we need to do is have more respect for boundaries rather than necessarily say the two things are completely separate. I think we need to give people trust and enable them to make decisions on what is right for them at that time. If somebody wants to be able to work in the evening, okay. fine, do it right? But that also means that they should get equal time off at some other point. The amount of times I've been told, you know, oh, you, you're on a, you, Sunday, you shouldn't be working. Like, who are you to tell me when I should and shouldn't be working? Maybe I'm not going to work on Monday. And I think that attitude of what is and isn't work, when it does, when it doesn't happen, you've seen this on LinkedIn, the kind of definition of what professional means anymore. It's like, I think all of those boundaries are, are really being challenged. I think there's no single model some people will want to be you know going 110 all the time because that's right for them other people want a different model some people will want to complete want complete separation other people want to have a bit more fluidity so i don't think there is ever going to be a sense that we've cracked it um, because there will always be something new that comes along but i think we've reached the point now where we're recognizing that a top-down dictated model doesn't work a manager somewhere saying this is how everybody's going to work now is not necessarily the right approach but more co-design more conversations with the organization and and a shift from organizational culture to team culture you can have more than one culture within a business and that those people in those team have an equal responsibility to say how do they want to work Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I love your word boundaries because I think one of the things I have been frustrated about for a long time, because we obviously do a four-day week here, is that people talk about the word flexible and what they mean is that you can work anywhere all of the time. (laughs) Um, And as we know, that's not necessarily healthy. And I think that notion of putting in place boundaries where you are responsible for your own life and then your own style of practice and your own style of work is so important it's so important important so that people have the opportunity to switch off and do the things that they want to do and that doesn't have to be deep and meaningful it can be laundry um i think that's vital because i think sometimes you know as we again have talked about if you spend a bit too much time operating these kind of very career oriented platforms LinkedIn being one of them then you can start to kind of feel as though your life has to be one constant pursuit of you know your big work uh you know purpose in life and actually I think it's really harmful for people to feel like that yeah really harmful yeah it really is I think there's there's two things you've prompted there the first is I think boundaries are ultimately about respect, aren't they? And, and respect for yourself, that you respect yourself enough to be able to take care, to invest in yourself, whether that's professionally or personally, and, and just kind of have love for yourself that I deserve time away from work. I deserve not to have an email sent to me and expect to be responded to, but respect from others as well of their time um, and and the, for those same things to, to create the space for that individual. Um, but I think yeah, th- this sense of worth and value, I think, is really the the big question here, isn't it? Like so much of the last 100 years, 200 years, work has defined your value, whether that's the salary that you're making or the job title, because, you know, a lot of it, it is a huge proportion of, of an inv- individual's life. And then in that comes the question of unpaid work, you know, being a parent, you know, where does that fit in the value equation? And, yeah. and I think what's super interesting with, in the UK, with housing being completely unaffordable these days, the old model was, I have to get a good job to get a good salary to move up the career progression ladder so that I can put down a deposit so I can get a mortgage so I can have a family so I can da 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 all this kind of now that you can't even think about affording a deposit suddenly there's like well if if that's never Mm. a thing why do I need to put in all of these hours why do I need to worry about the job title or the salary I just need to I want to do stuff that is motivating that is rewarding that I'm enjoying that I'm getting a sense of satisfaction from or is creating an impact in the world and I think that value 
equation has started to shift that's become more individual that person goes I want to be creating value or feeling value and that doesn't necessarily mean money anymore yeah that's so true it just occurred to me actually I mean I'm a parent of a one-year-old so I'm learning how to be a parent all the time failing mostly but you know that's we're, we're kind of working it out, aren't we? failing, working yeah. it out. and I think people have said to me that now being a parent is something that's such uncharted territory because no one knows how to parent children of this era because we've never done it before. So the age of the internet and all that sort of stuff presents so many new challenges to parenting. And it just struck me that the same is true of careers, right? That most of the careers that people do now didn't exist 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so we are still working it out in terms of what value looks like and how our relationship with work needs to feel for us. And we don't know the answers to that because we've never done it before. So I guess we are all in this kind of human-centred guinea pig mode, right? Which hopefully should be taken as a real positive that we're all in a very similar situation and having to navigate that uncertainty and and, and new frontiers which is why i love the the squiggly career stuff that helen and sarah do because they're challenging this notion of a career ladder progression that it's a line and it's upward not everybody wants to get to ceo i've never had any interest in in running business or being a ceo or boss or anything i i love doing great work and I've intentionally kind of put a, a, a cap at my own level of progression in that I don't want to be managing people. I just want to be part of the people doing that stuff. I think it is all completely up for grabs. It can make it feel really so much harder, though, because then you're having to figure out what that is for yourself. If somebody gives you a, a task or an objective or a target, it's like, oh, all I need to do now is figure out how to get there. Whereas if you don't have the sense of what is it that I'm trying to get to, it can feel really unanchored and can feel really kind of, uh, you know, kind of confusing. And and this is this is true for a lot of people in our community is when they're struggling and going, did I make the right decision to go freelance? You have to sometimes say, well, what were the reasons that you did that? What is it that, that good looks like for you? What does success look like? What is positive? A lot of people don't have a sense of what that is. Sometimes it was just, I don't want to be in a job anymore. And the alternative is being self-employed as a sense of what what is success for you? And it's a, it's a, it's a really hard question. I'm sure there's no shortage of, you know, kind of motivational speaker authored books on what success is. And they're probably all horrific. But I think having a sense of what good looks like for you, even if it's really loosely defined, does that mean more time with my family or friends? Does that mean a sense of satisfaction of the work that I'm doing? Does it mean money? Because you still have to eat, you still have to pay the bills. You know, all of these things kind of need to smudge together a little bit. But if you don't have a sense of what those things are, it can be really hard to know whether you are doing well or not. And on those bad days so much easier to remember the worst days and the and the bad things than the small incremental steps towards a goal it can be hard to step back and go yeah okay Thursday was pretty rubbish but in the grand scheme of things I'm moving towards something so you can see why people feel just a little bit lost at times for you and I'm taking this at a kind of quite personal level here what does it mean to be that kind of human-centered business that that makes it good for you to work in like what would be the things that you would say would be most vital and most important oh that's a really so I've been employed once I've this is it it's really hard for me to answer that question because I haven't been in organizations where I could say well I know it's not that I know all this thing was great but I think it probably comes back to respect first of all it's like uh, working with people that respect you as an individual and and kind of go okay I have a sense of who you are what you're trying to do and my job as your manager or boss or whatever is is to remove the things that are preventing you from doing that in a way that is is respectful of you is mindful of you I think that is the the key thing the second thing would be opportunities to do work which is has impact is is motivating to me the work which I love doing is stuff that opens I people's eyes to the possibility and go oh we oh yeah we'd not seen that before or this is a different way of looking and and 
working on projects where people are not so stuck in their ways and they refuse to see that the opportunity to kind of go this is something different we could learn from this we could change from this so I think those are the two things that are really respect for the individual and the opportunity to to do great work are the most important things amazing what are you looking forward to next at leapers what's next on the agenda for you guys I wish we had an agenda. I wish I was that organised. <laughs> it's our fifth anniversary this year, so um, congratulations! Thank you. Um, it, it's it's September, August, September time is is our birthday, so we'll probably be doing something to try and um, look back at the people that have been part of the community for the last five years and and see what the last few years of, of their journeys have been, um, because people come and go in our community as they as they do in any space. So I just want to try and connect with some of the people who were with us at the start uh, and, and kind of see how their journeys have changed over the last five years. Um, the, the, the main thing which we are continually trying to do is uh, help individuals be more actively aware. And that means being more present. It's not about dragging people all over to leapers and saying, come to us, join the community, come to sign it. That's not our model. We want to be more visible in more places so when you are doing your invoices there's a little reminder that goes oh okay I've I've sorted out my payments now I'm just going to go take 15 minutes to see how I felt about those projects or those relationships Um, so try and be more present in more places to just prompt people to think more often about their well-being and the third thing is working with uh, organizations employees clients who hire freelancers to say how can we help you help them what are the things that you are uh, not doing that will just help your freelancers do better work for you? Whether that is simple stuff like signposting. Hey, the, the 66% of freelancers don't know where to turn for support for their mental health. And employers have an amazing opportunity to get that number to zero by just saying, here are some of the places. So working with organizations that can help us help their people do brilliant work uh, and more coffee. I think we all need more coffee in our lives. I've got a one-year-old, so I live on coffee. Coffee is very much needed. I've got, so I've got two children, nine and 11-year-old. And we went to our our trip at the end of COVID. We went away and managed to get to to Venice. Oh, amazing. Yeah, um, we were really excited about it. Really fortunate to be able to go there for a long weekend. And you can't go to Italy without having cappuccinos for breakfast, right? Absolutely. So I introduced my, my children to caffeine, the... Only acceptable drug. <laughs> and do they make you coffee in the morning now? That's my goal. <laughs> they can gr- they can weigh out the beans and grind it. I'm not yet happy with them making the hot water. Um, I can see that. But um, if I could get my one year old to make a cup of tea, I think I probably would. But it's perhaps a little early. If they can switch on the teas made, yeah, that's probably just yeah, enough. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. It's been absolutely lovely to chat to you, and good luck with this. Thank you so much. Thank you.